introduce our uh, representative from AIA Wisconsin. His name is Jake Morrison. And he is a licensed architect and lead certified professional. Jacob holds a Master of Architecture's degree from the Savannah College of Art and Design and has worked for several award-winning firms, including Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer Associates and Robert A.M. Stern Architects, before moving to Madison to found his own firm with partner Matthew Tills. So Jake, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, today, our speaker is Mark Johnson. Uh, Mark founded the firm Signal Architecture and Research in 2014 in Seattle, Washington. As a place-based integrative design firm, his career as a design collaborator informs a practice of iteration and exploration, drawing from the best from clients, teammates, and community members alike, and his leadership excels at a range of projects, types, and scales. His work with cultural institutions, municipalities, and communities have allowed him to develop a keen eye toward architecture and landscape as a system and a true sustainability of place. I've personally known Mark since our days together at college. And even though Mark's, even then Mark's talent to look beneath the surface of a project and to listen and see the essentials of what informed the project were obvious. And since then he's created a body of work that represents what is really almost an empathic ability to create wonderful architecture from even the most ordinary opportunities. So having said that, I will hand it over to Mark to show us some of those uh, examples. Thank you so much, Heather and Jake. Um, and thanks to everyone for attending. I'm really happy to be here today and really glad to, to talk through some projects. So I'm gonna share the screen here. Um, I think I've got all the buttons clicked that should be clicked and you should be seeing uh, Cottonwood Canyon Experience Center. So we'll talk today about the power of place. Um, Power Place is, is a design tool um, that, as Jake said, I've really looked back to um, through my career and our firm looks to it as a guide. Um, it's the intrinsic character of a place, a region, nature, and its people to influence where design inspiration can begin. So understanding the site forces through research reveals the technical and ephemeral components of a site as the first step in the design process that can influence form, material, location, and function. There are many elements that establish the power of a place. In many cases, it's environment, people, culture. Uh, I'll drop a number of names today, and I'd ask you to follow up in the Q&A if you'd like to learn more about each of them. It's an approach that, that is really the DNA of our practice. And it's an, as important now as it's ever been. Much of the work we envision is on indigenous land. Uh, we ask how that informs our design understanding. Um, I, I was lucky to work with a, a, a true master architect, John Paul Jones, uh, for about 12 years at Jones and Jones. Um, and, and he really um, instilled some, some practice in me that um, really looks to the land as a guide uh, for how we design. And I also respect that I'm sitting on land ceded from the Duwamish tribe. Uh, I'm, I'm on Alki Point in Seattle, Washington. Uh, and for that, I'm grateful. So there are many right answers to a design prompt, right? Aligning the response with the people and the place is what'll make it timeless. Um, through these projects of varying scales and locations, we'll, we'll look at how the voice of a place um, and the forces around it can influence the design of these projects. And as we're going, um, feel free to add to the Q&A with the stories of your projects or the stories of your places um, that influence your design approach. And, and we'll talk about that after the, after the talk. So I'd be remiss to start a talk in this series without a reference to Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, I had a chance to go back to Falling Water last year. Um, and while the lofting views across the waterfall are postcard perfect, um, this first impression is a showstopper. Um, as students, you know, we studied um, the, the object, the result of design, the thing, right? It's this moment though, at this site that you realize what that object does. It does something, it changes you. And it's that element that can bring lightness, dancing with nature, the intertwining of time. Um, and as a result of time, this one's had 85 years to heal into the forest. And it, it really is hard to tell. Um, 
where architecture stops and nature begins. So the projects we'll talk about today are in the Pacific Northwest. Um, well, it sounds like we've got folks from all over um, here joining us today. Uh, so we'll be focused in the upper upper left corner. And we'll start with a project called uh, Mercer Slough Environmental Education Center. And you'll see some of these taglines um, that the projects have brought about. And this one, we like to say it's where the trees made the rules. Uh, it was a result of a long site search to settle on a property at the edge of, of Lake Washington in second generation or second growth forest. The partnership between the city of Bellevue and Pacific Science Center with the shared vision of environmental education at the doorstep of a growing city. Uh, the team was Jones and Jones Architects and Landscape Architects as the architect of record. I was the project architect and project manager um, with close partnership with uh, Pace Civil Engineering. Um, without them, we couldn't have done a project like this. Uh, so here's where we are. We're in the, the Salish Sea, or right along the Salish Sea in Lake Washington. So we'll look at watersheds for a minute because this site saw some really deep change uh, throughout time, um, really in the last hundred years. Um, the watersheds that work their way to Puget Sound, our body, a big body of water here is Puget Sound, and then up to the Northwest goes to the Pacific Ocean. Um, this is Lake Washington here, our site's about in here. Uh, the water used to run uh, south through the Cedar of Watershed into the Green Duwamish Watershed and then into Puget Sound. It was quite a long run of water. So there was a lot of uh, nutrient exchange and, and life that happened along that. So looking at that again, from the 1902 map, here's the burgeoning growth of Seattle, Elliott Bay, which is our bay that the city has formed around the Duwamish River is this squiggling line that was about 15 miles long. The water ran from Lake Washington down into the Duwamish River and out to Elliott Bay. In 1914, the river was straightened and Lake Washington, the ship canal was built to connect uh, from Lake Washington out to Puget Sound for shipping, um, logging, many uh, different agricultural and, and industrial uses were, um, uh, were developed to create that connection. And as a result, the lake was lowered by about nine feet. So imagine that you know, a large uh, body of water is, uh, is lowered by nine feet, a lot of land is exposed. Um, there was a um, a wise move by the city of Bellevue um, to maintain that land as either farmland or um, recreational land. So that then brought the opportunity for exploration within the city. Can you imagine kayaking uh, your way into town? And as such, it became, Mercer School became a very important uh, place that um, was an extension of, of how schools operated in the city of Bellevue. Pacific Science Center is our local science center in Seattle, and a partnership between, um, between the two organizations was born, uh, hands in the water and feet on the ground, we like to say. So the prompt was, uh, let's create an environmental education center on this land. And you know, when you see kids here, there's your environmental education center, right? We're architects and we could, we could write ourselves out of some work by just building a dock and, and um, having kids put their hands in the water. So we began to think, okay, how do we think like an organism? And, and what questions do we ask? Um, first thing we do as architects, right? We're all in this room, we're all doing this. Where are we? So we embrace the landscape we're interpreting to integrate the facility with the student's experience. Think about, you know, what's, who are the students after they've experienced this, this place? And, and how can we then begin to inform them? Uh, the site is a, is a pretty steep slope down to a wetland from the campus. So there's this real opportunity that if we allow this slope to remain, the nutrients that work their way from the campus down into the wetland can then work into the hill. A more conventional mode might be to fill this hill site and set the building on it. Uh, we took a different step and thought, could we make a common plane between the campus and the wetland to elevate the buildings above grade, then create this viewpoint out into the wetland and over the wetland and allow water to flow below the buildings. The site was pretty fragile um, it's, it's a site that probably only an environmental education center uh, should occupy. And as such, the city of Bellevue uh, created a zoning um, allowance for it um, to occupy that site. Uh, we had been through a number of sites. Uh, the project was about 25,000 square feet of, of occupiable space. Um, and when we moved to this site, we realized we were going to really have to change and be flexible uh, with that space to, to get it to fit on the site. So this is where we talk about the trees making the rules. 
this was our tree assessment of the major trees on the site. So these are big leaf maples that are anywhere from four to six feet in diameter, uh, multi-stem trunks, um, pretty uh, substantial trees on the site. So we began to think about the spaces in between the trees that we could begin to occupy with buildings. Um, and I'm gonna tap Jake here and uh, he'll remember the lecture by Meryl Elam and a project that she brought um, to school uh, when we were at Savannah College of Art and Design. And it was a home that was built in one of the voids of where a tree fell. And we had a very similar opportunity here where trees had not grown in clay layers. So that gave us the opportunity to place the building. So as we begin to look, there's an existing building on the site, which was called the Sullivan House. Um, it, had, uh, it had moved here uh, or had been moved here previously. And you can see the voids here uh, that are within the trees. So we began to think about ways of shrinking the building. Um, going back to that idea of the kids on the dock, can we use outdoor space as this interstitial learning? And that began, began um, a mode of creating smaller buildings, smaller building footprints that could then expand as um, classrooms into the forest. So the water and the trees began to be the guide for us. So minimizing cross slope, avoiding impervious walls that concentrate water, and using permeable retaining walls, we were able to then create a framework of footprints where the buildings could fit within the trees. So the footprints of the buildings were pile caps. We used helical pilings uh, that could be driven into the hill slope. Uh, They're about 40 feet long, uh, allowed the buildings to occupy the space between the trees and to let the water flow between them. So about 10% of the building footprint actually touched the ground. So beginning to look at the elevated footprints, thinking of that idea of a dock, connecting the buildings through these elevated boardwalks then created these exterior classrooms so that students could work their way in and out of the buildings and, um, and expand on that ability for, for teaching space. Looking at the building types, uh, this brought about a theme of thinness and lightness. Uh, the tan shapes here, are the elevated buildings, we call them aerial buildings. Uh, they're above grade. Uh, they have very, very simple utilities in them. Uh, the restroom buildings and the wet lap buildings we're calling terrestrial buildings. These are heavy green roof buildings um, that are very, uh, they have a, a, a heavy water use. Um, they're wet labs. Uh, samples are coming up out of the, um, the slough and being sampled here. And then looking at how the water is distributed uh, within the site. So water is captured on the roofs, it's run along rills, along guardrails, and then spilled down onto splash blocks and areas that can work their way down into, um, into the wetland. So beginning to zoom in, uh, we're at the, the middle of the site here, thinking of the idea of a log jam or uh, the way that nutrients are captured, that's the exchange of knowledge. Uh, there's a threshold uh, where vehicular traffic can uh, drop folks off. And this is that idea of leaving the city behind. And once you walk in and down into the campus, um, the walls then provide wayfinding, place to sit, and then a place to allow the stormwater to work its way into the site. As we zoom out, the South Lobe is focused on learning. Uh, it's classrooms. There's a tree house that overlooks the forest. Uh, the North Lobe is community focused with a visitor center, a multi-purpose space and the ability for these two buildings to connect across the deck with an overlook that, that then expands out to the city. And here we are viewing toward the south lobe, looking at uh, the multi-purpose building and the visitor center here, um, balancing the site with the buildings. And as we look at how the buildings from below, they really are lifting off and it's about that lightness um, and allowing nature to return beneath the buildings. Uh, the building uh, disturbance footprint for construction um, was about uh, five, well, within five feet inside the footprints of the building. So we were able to essentially build the buildings under uh, where they would occupy their space in the air. And then the classroom spaces that then expand out onto the decks, the tree house here um, in the distance, uh, and then access down to the slough. And the overlook, it's this idea that we took that was a book and a microscope can teach students in the classroom, absolutely. Uh, and we felt strongly that the experience 
was the thing that really imprinted the memory upon the kids who passed through here. So we'll jump from Mercer Slough to Icicle Creek Center for the Arts. And the music of the Spheres is the story here. Um, it's located in Leavenworth, Washington, at the foot of Icicle Canyon in the Cascade Mountains. The jagged forms of the mountains and the alpine climate prompted a resilient architecture, a very simple, expressive form inspired by vernacular barns and the materials of the region. The team was Jones and Jones again. Uh, Michael Yantis of Santec was our acoustic lead, uh, and he was instrumental uh, working with us to create uh, elemental moments of acoustics and sound experience for the visitor and the musician alike. Located in the Cascade Mountains here, so Seattle is right around here. Again, Puget Sound going out to the Pacific Ocean. Icicle Creek Center for the Arts is a, a residency-based uh, music education program, as well as performing arts center, where uh, resident artists will occupy this space for uh, a week to a year, uh, from high school up to uh, PhD and, and master's level study. Uh, the Jagged Forms of the Mountains really inspired this form um, to work its way into the landscape. This is a knoll that the building is, is nestled up against. And we'll look at the uh, master recital hall, which was named Canyon Wren here um, today. Uh, one of the elements that came from this um, was a challenge by the owner of the property. She had a number of artifacts from the, the civilian conservation corps camp that was on the site previously. And she challenged us to make this facility more than just a set of buildings. She left it open to us to interpret. And we felt pretty strongly that the idea of Pythagoras and the music of the spheres could begin to play something here, or there could be something with numerology that could begin to, to um, advise the design approach, um, but we didn't quite have it yet. So zooming out to the site plan, Canyon Ren is here with vistas up the canyon toward the Sleeping Lady Rock Formation, which we'll see in a few minutes, um, a vegetated, uh, very steep um, bluff of granite, and then views up into the, into the forest, a cluster of residential cabins where musicians will um, be staying during their, or be living during their stay, and a series of practice cabins that nestle their way into the hill site. So orienting folks to the site and nature was key to the design brief and creating an experience that was part of uh, someone's life um, was, was instrumental to, uh, to creating memories here. So this is an example of uh, the glass that we were presented with. Um, it's about a quarter of an inch thick. It had come out of a church that was on site uh, that was expanded to become really the first chapel or performing, performance space for Icicle Creek Music Center. And rather than using this glass as just an ornament, we tested ourselves to give it a purpose and the opportunity to, opportunity to represent music theory through the use of light, color, and pattern evolved. So we studied the voices of space and sound theorists, um, Harry Parch, Iana Sinakis, John Cage, um, back to Pythagoras. And the numbers drove the approach and story of this facility. Um, if you recall, the, the Pythagoras' music of the spheres was the seven spheres of Babylon, which were the, uh, the seven planets that were visible to the astronomer's eye at that time. Um, and what we call planets today weren't the planets then. It was the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. We added Mars because it was rising at the time of construction. So we looked at the numerology, odd, even, major, minor, whole numbers, divisible or not divisible, inform patterns of interior finishes, structure, and fenestration. Looking at some of the colors as they begin to take shape within the acoustic wall. Patterns in the north wall represent the major key. They're the even number. Pythagoras felt that that was the male gender. It holds four of the seven of Pythagoras' spheres. The south wall is smooth, reflective, resilient, and it represents the minor key, the odd integer, the feminine, and the indivisible, the resilient. 
the quiet. It carries three planets. The articulated west wall represents the sun. Its 36 panes represent the sum of the meeting of the first odd and even squares. So the north wall and the south wall squared is 36 panes of glass. And the views toward the Sleeping Lady rock formation remind visitors that they're in a place that's part of a larger time scale. And here they can be inspired to explore the ephemeral and technical breadth of their musical study in light, sound, nature, and study. And as we look to details, uh, the acoustic north wall is inter intertwined with the light of the spheres, uh, influencing the listener and the musician alike. Uh, the walls of the building, uh, for a technical aside, we are in an alpine environment. So the double stud thermally broken walls gave us an extra thickness to play with and then adding another 12 to 14 inches of depth on the wall for acoustic treatment also gave us a lot of, uh, a lot of play uh, that we could articulate that surface with. And then there are the happy accidents that come from the light the sun shining through these lenses that then walk their way across the, the weather-worn maple floor of the facility. And time is constantly moving uh, throughout the day. So we'll jump now to a different type of project, Georgetown Wet Weather Treatment Station. And we like to call it the theater of a storm. Uh, this is a combined sewer overflow facility so um, some folks may know, uh, I can't do a hand raise right now to ask folks if they know what that is. Uh, a combined sewer overflow is a, an underground system that some municipalities use that will route stormwater, so rainwater, to uh, water bodies in order to convey them from our impervious service surfaces in our communities. They are also connected in parallel to the sewage system. So when there are heavy rainstorms, sometimes the combined sewer overflow will overflow a mixture of stormwater and sewage into our water bodies. In the case here, that's the Duwamish River. Uh, that's the tribe I referred to earlier. And the Duwamish is uh, Seattle's only river. So uh, for this project, the Georgetown Wet Weather Treatment Station would divert that overflow into a treatment facility that would then clean the water and release it to the river as a clean, uh, clean water um, once the storm has passed. The project's located in the gateway to an industrial arts neighborhood in Seattle. So an informed municipality of King County, a very present and very vocal design advisory group of community members and an integrative team worked to create a facility uh, that would be operating on Seattle's darkest and wettest days that e is equal parts urban design and interpretive infrastructure. The team is uh, King County is the owner. Uh, Jacobs Engineering was the prime. Uh, the associate architect with us is Miller Hull, Burger Partnership for Landscape Architecture. Uh, Blanca Lighting uh, was our lighting consultant and San Fasan is the master artist for the facility. So as we look at where we are, we're right south of Seattle here on the Salish Sea, and we'll zoom in on the Duwamish River. So again, this is the uh, historic meander of the Duwamish River, and this is the current meander. So we went from about 15 miles to five miles, and it rains in Seattle. I think that rumor is true. Um, couple that with the compacted watershed, impervious surfaces, and the combined sewer overflow, then the perfect storm occurs when Seattle is a rainstorm. The raw sewage will mix with the stormwater and then flow its way into Puget Sound. That affects salmon, seals, orca, all of us. So add another layer, um, the, when the river was straightened in 1914, it made the water flow that much faster and the nutrients flow that much faster out of Seattle. So I'll zoom out for a second. And we've seen many excellent examples of infrastructure in the hands of architects and planners that contribute to the urban fabric. Um, we've seen Amager by Big, um, MBBJ's project, VGF, Stephen Hall, Skylab, just to name a few. There are many other uh, fantastic examples of infrastructure. However, the image here is still quite common. Uh, razor wire fence, a no trespassing sign. Um, these facilities historically were off the beaten path, uh, but in this case, we're right at the front door to the community. And through this in-depth community engagement process, the design team heard that the community wanted to see what was typically hidden 
and understand the beautiful machine that was working for the neighborhood. Our partner architects, uh, Miller Hall Partnership, um, the principal who we're working with there, Scott Wolf, um, likes to say, uh, we're making the invisible visible. Uh, so we've got an example here uh, from, uh, from Seattle, two from Seattle. Uh, one is the East Pine substation um, by Bassetti Architects in the 1950s. Uh, this was a real attempt to, to create um, a visibility of a power substation. Um, it, I think it got, it got close. Um, there was still a wall at the perimeter of the facility. Um, and then we have Denny substation on the right uh, by NBBJ, which uh, has just completed construction. And this is a power substation uh, as is the, the um, East Pine. So things used to be out of sight, out of mind. And today we make the invisible visible. So the Denny substation embraces the city edge, creating a live perimeter to the substation. Uh, some might not even know that there's a critical public utility there. Uh, the infrastructure becomes a place. Um, there are steps within this permeability that we'll discuss in the session that, um, that can provide tools for design expression and community integration. So starting with our site, um, we have architects here. Uh, so I think you'll appreciate um, that we had few tools for design. We had proportion, scale, alignment and material. The token elements for, in, uh, for infrastructure and a palette that's full of potential. Uh, the typical wastewater treatment process, or typical wastewater treatment plant, sorry, are optimized for access to the function, typically with distributed buildings that can be driven around or walked around um, with visual access um, to each of the, the functions and of an impermeable fence. We took the opportunity uh, to work with the engineering team to align the structures, to begin to create a vis visible order of how the water was treated so that a bypasser could see what the process was from the property line. Then we took that a step further. We stacked the heavy and loud vertical functions toward the back of the site away from the busy corner and then put the public um, lower, smaller elements closer to the urban edge. That gave us the opportunity to fold down one of the fence lines and use the building as an edge. That, the, that visible or uh, visual permeability then worked its way around the edge of the facility. And we were able to see not only along the edge here of the facility, we were able to wrap that awareness all the way around the facility. Uh, Burger Partnership uh, led the charge on creating a demonstration out of this facility while it treats the, the combined stormwater overflow of this area of Seattle, it's actually treating all of its stormwater on site with natural system. It retains about 60,000 gallons of stormwater um, to recycle on site uh, and has examples of um, permeable paving and uh, bioretention surfaces that can be demonstrated and, and used as examples in the region. So let's look at it in plan. Taking the corner here, 4th Ave and Michigan, this is the front door to the arts and industrial neighborhood. So creating this symbolic visual connection to the neighborhood um, made the first step toward creating a facility that, that welcomes people to understanding how this place works. Water comes in from the combined sewer line is treated and then it moves out. And you can see the color changing as it moves from dark blue to light blue. Looking at the landscape, the operations facility is a beacon. Uh, we were able to uh, work with the community and King County to create a partnership between the operations and education so that local schools, uh, trade schools, uh, South Seattle Community College and other universities can use the operations building as a training facility during seasons that it is not heavily in use. So it rains here from October to, uh, well, seems like June, but um, it rains heavily from October to February. So that's when the place is most active. So the other months of the year, it can be used for uh, community and education functions. As you can see, the elements are clustered together uh, with the heavy, louder elements here in this taller volume, the underground elements closer to the property line, and the um, active uh, functional elements right here at the corner. So we begin to look at how we integrated with the community and created this 
using the power of the place to create this alignment that could build identity around what this facility was. So going back to the community, they wanted to see how the beautiful machine worked. There's as much below grade as there is above grade. And it's a very powerful system. However, it's still a wastewater treatment facility. You or I can't just walk in when we want to. So we began to play with the idea of light and looking at how we could use visually permeable edges and light systems to tell the story of how this facility operated. The view from the corner is welcoming, the gathering space and training space at the corner, public art, giving back to the community at this gateway, and then the theater of the storm. So applying this lighting narrative, we're back in plan. This is the training room that we talked about and just saw the public art is right here. Uh, when the facility becomes operational, um, it gets dark here around five o'clock in the winter. So you've got this very uh, wet environment with glistening pavement and dark skies. Uh, we identified that there was a signal uh, that once these pumps became operational above this million gallon water tank, the large pipes along the south side of the facility would be illuminated. And I say large pipes, everything is supersized on this facility. Uh, each of these little dots here is a 200 horsepower pump. Uh, these pipes are uh, 24 inches in diameter. Um, they're very visible. So using a 5,000 K LED light fixture sounds horrible anywhere else. In this location, it creates these actors who are coming onto stage and signifying that something is happening here. And as the action is rising, the regulator, this is a very small, very powerful building. This is the gate that opens the eight foot diameter pipe uh, from the combined sewer overflow and allows water to flow into the space. Once that's lit, then the grit and the screening start to work. Below this ring here is a million gallons of frothy, very, very dirty water. And this small building works hard to take the branches and the rocks and the couches and other pieces of things that get into the water out of it. These elements that are illuminated are the odor control. They're keeping the smells of what's going on underneath uh, from getting into the community. And as the facility becomes operational, ballasted sedimentation, the first stage of, of wastewater treatment begins to happen. That's where the water goes from gray brown uh, to start to become clear. And as it works its way into ultraviolet treatment, it becomes disinfected and it becomes more clear as it works its way there. And then the whole operation uh, closes down in reverse. The beauty of a configuration like this is that it's not always the same. Sometimes only the regulator will open. Other times only the stage lights will come on and the storm will be will pass before um, the facility is, is operational. So from a distance, you see this element that's in this rainy industrial landscape and signifies that something is happening here. So we'll now jump out to the desert. So we just went from urban Seattle in the manufacturing industrial core. And now we're out in the middle of the Oregon desert. So we're in central Oregon. Um, time is ever present in this landscape. These lines that you see are from the geologic floods um, that were part of the ice age floods. When the water receded, it made marks in this landscape that are then magnified by the grasses that grow on it. This geologic time is, is present everywhere. And then we look at the human time. Uh, the historic barns uh, dot the landscape, uh, historic farms, there aren't many left, um, but some of them still, still um, march through this landscape uh, along with the, um, the air motors and windmills that now begin to, to dot the landscape. And this facility really was um, an element that could serve uh, as a historian uh, to the import importance of the agrarian industry um, past, present, and in the future. So again, here's Seattle. We're right down here at the Columbia River. Uh, is right about here. It works its way out to the Pacific, right out here. Uh, and we are here in Central Oregon. Conwood Canyon State Park was established in 2013. Um, it's Oregon's second largest state park with over 8,000 acres. 
uh, prior to its founding, uh, the land was privately owned for decades with um, no public access. Uh, the, pub the park was established as a monument uh, to the outdoor experience and a gateway to the natural habitats and wildlife that, that can only be found in this unexplored territory of Oregon. Uh, unlike Oregon's other parks that act as entry points to beaches or public waterways, Cottonwood is a destination. It's the only park in Oregon with an unprecedented amount of, um, amount of wildlife and unrestricted access to the John Day River. Merth Cal Camp, um, 8,000 beautiful, fragile, rugged acres in the John Day Valley. So I'm gonna say something about John Day here real quick. Remember the film, The Revenant with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio? Um, that, that main character uh, is similar to who John Day was, um, an incredibly rugged individual uh, who had to fight to live, uh, sometimes had to fight a bear to live. Um, that's what it's like out here. Um, the landscape is equally resilient and it's also incredibly fragile. So when we look at the walls, remnants exist uh, of time. Uh, this lichen changes throughout the year. Um, most of the year when it's hot, it's gray, um, but there are times in the spring and fall when it's green and orange and these beautiful colors um, that come and go um, are incredibly fragile in this landscape. The center is a time marker on the site. Uh, this is an image of, of the cow camp. Uh, the barn was still here. Um, there was a master plan performed by Walker Macy uh, and some of the early concepts on the site were to, uh, to put an environmental education center here um, that would then be very similar to Mercer Slough that we talked about earlier. Uh, when we became involved in the project, uh, there, was, um, there were conversations that had happened at the, um, the judicial level to begin to create a conversation um, across the urban and rural divide. Um, there were our political divisions in Oregon, and there were conversations uh, that wanted to create a place um, that could put nature at the center of that and create a facility that would welcome uh, all Oregonians out to John Day. Um, to explore the landscape. And that made us really realize that there's a hierarchy on a ranch. Nothing is larger than the barn. Uh, you can sense the power that it has here. It's been here for so much time. Um, it's been the story keeper. Uh, it's the timekeeper. So we look to the barn and its time and its grit and its character uh, to then inform the new building. We didn't mimic it. We didn't copy it we borrowed from it. So looking at the simple diagram, we took the upper gable monitor of the barn and looked to the proportions of this building. Um, the barn is recognizable in the Oregon landscape. And it's something that can um, both uh, create memory, uh, can create nostalgia, can create home, and can create safety. Simple plan shows the toolbox nature of the building. Uh, taking that idea of the environmental education center that was a technical building and actually making it such so that the technical elements could be stored away. Um, it could be used for multiple functions, um, creating one band of light that aligns with the fire, both welcomes daylight into the space, as well as signifying that something is happening here. It opens to the outdoors, protects inhabitants from the weather and creates a safe place. It has a hard shell on one side to the left here. Uh, the wind is always coming from that direction. Uh, that side can be closed down and we're in the lee on the right side. It's a safe provision for research and exploration at the foot of a hill, opening up to the experience of the valley and settles into the land to become part of the place. The arbor and siding are made of juniper. And this is a, an, an interesting play on, on the region here. Um, juniper is a, it's a lovely plant in the landscape visually, um, but it is, uh, it's quite an invasive species. Um, it's a water hog. Um, it creates incredibly dry landscapes in an already dry landscape, which uh, creates a, uh, promotes fire danger, um, and then will uh, sequester other um, native plants from thriving. So typically the trees are cut down, uh, split, uh, for fence posts or burned. Um, and we worked with Oregon State Parks Forever, uh, which was the foundation that funded the project to, uh, to create a material path to construction for this lesser used, typically discarded material. Um, we were able to use, um, use it pretty judiciously where we could use very, very thick sections of it uh, for siding 
and then we were able to get this fairly wobbly um, or uh, wavery uh, arbor that really creates a nice play you'll see in the shadows um, uh, with the sun. Landscape texture is dry and it's complex and the weather is really powerful. And the simple form holds an elegant stance within that rugged and fragile landscape. It's a gathering place for two to 200 uh, with education, recreational programming, welcome to all. Um, so it's academics from preschool to PhD, uh, from researchers uh, working with um, prairie rabbits to uh, smallmouth bass and um, bighorn sheep. It hosts family, community, and cultural events. Uh, it's a toolbox for gathering, much the way that the regional barns have served the valley through time. Putting openings where they are most needed away from the wind extends the usable footprint of the building. Uh, this 1,500 square foot building acts like a 3,000 square foot building. Um, it has a uh, kitchen and cleaning station inside and then a camp kitchen to the exterior. So it can really expand out into the landscape. So I've been talking for about 30 minutes and I wanted to share this video by our friend Juan Benavides. He captured the space of the landscape so well with this film um, and you can hear it. We'll take a minute here, it's about three minutes long. The simple twist and the engagement with the place, visitors at all times of the year know that something's happening here and they're invited to join in the conversation. I wanna thank you all for being with me today uh, to hear about the power of place. And I'd, I'd welcome a conversation here um, as we open up for a uh, for conversation about um, how the power of place is embedded in your work and any questions you might have for me. So if you use the Q&A, uh, you can get some questions in, and uh, Heather will be able to to get them get them to Jake and me. I had a quick question to start off, Mark. Um, the graphics you have in your presentation are really compelling about explaining the project and explaining the issues. How much of that do you do during the process versus sort of you know, reviewing it and, and creating it afterwards to explain mm -hmm. what's already happened. Because so much of what we have to do is explain to somebody these ideas. As architects, ultimately what we're doing is creating all these presentation materials. Mm -hmm. So how much of that is part of your process? That's a great question. Um, we try to um, 
to create it as much with the project as we can. We try to not post rationalize the work, uh, though sometimes we do. Um, we will for um, to tell the story if it's going to go into a, uh, an award submission or if it's going to be submitted for for other recognition. Uh, we'll produce it for that. But um, just thinking about the plan for for Cottonwood, um, that was really about conveying why that light plot was there. Um, looking at not only daylight and how it would bring daylight into the space, um, but how it would be a signifier to the exterior. Uh, so we also produce um, renderings that are um, typically less realistic than, um, than uh, uh, they're more on the less realistic, more stylized side so that we can exemplify what it is we're trying to convey. Um, like the theater of the storm with the light puffs, it's really a plan with a simple Photoshop dropper on there. However, we could convey to the public works director or the project manager at King County, how it was going to work. Yeah. And, and those came, those actually came as questions from him directly. Like, I don't understand that you tell me about this rising <laughs> action. I don't understand. So that's where diagrams have very much um, yeah. have driven a lot of our work. That's interesting because it's an illustration of an idea mm -hmm. rather than just a purely technical presentation. Mm -hmm. And the time that I had at Miller Hall, that was something that was really driven home, um, working with Dave Miller and Bob Hall. Um, Dave's a, a UW, University of Washington uh, prof. He was the Dean of Architecture. Um, the school is really well known for its diagramming um, and you know, going into Rhino and building diagrams so that you mm -hmm. can convey very simply the design uh, of what you're doing. And you know, I think it was said to us way back, if you can't draw it, you can't build it. And that idea of simplifying to a diagram really helps us convey the message of what we're trying to do. Because if we stumble with our diagrams, then we're, we're stumbling with the design. That's interesting. I, I noticed we have some questions in the queue. I just wanted to say, Mark, that it was a terrific presentation. And what struck me is that and I mean this as a compliment, I hope it comes across as such, just that you seem to go in with very little or no preconceived notions of where this will take you. <laughs> Is that accurate? Project? I mean, when you go into a new project, there's a lot of learning, it seems like you're doing, and it's really uh, quite incredible and impressive. <laughs> Thanks. It's something that took, um, it took a long time, you know, to, I think, outgrow my, I guess, my own ego. Right. Um, we as architects, we've got it figured out. First five minutes, like we got it figured out. I got it. Um, I had the chance to work with um, with the Seven Group, with um, with John Becker and um, Bill Reed on a on a wastewater facility, and they would always say this thing that was suspend disbelief. I think we hear that more and more, right? Um, but the way that we took that was actually don't solve the problem, don't solve the design problem yet. Let the brief evolve. And if you can hold the question collectively as long as possible, then we'll get an answer that actually really might fit this as opposed to, well, I've got five or six designs that I've not been able to pull off yet. And I've been sketching them for 15 years. <laughs> and I'm going to get this one that's got the cool cantilevered box in this project. Oh, this is the one. Yeah. And sometimes that happens and it works and it's like, oh, the stars align. A lot of times you'll wind up value engineering because it doesn't fit the whatever or the program doesn't fit. And then you kind of medioc mediocritize everything, both the brief and the design idea. So I think that holding the, the challenge or the question as long as possible without having the answer really feeds our practice. Mm. Sounds like it would be difficult and that you get better over time maybe with it. It's very, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's see. Uh, let's go to our audience here. We had a, a comment from Melissa who, who just wanted to say that she says, we have combined sewer systems in Sacramento and overflow is a thing, she says. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, Tom asks, do you or have you used harmonic or mathematical patterns in some of your other projects similar to the music hall? Um, not to that degree. However, we do have an acoustician who works with us on many of our projects. Um, we're working on a radio station in Port Townsend and a uh, uh, performing arts theater in, um, sorry, Olympia, Washington. Um, so yes, and uh, we hope to bring that level of 
of um, physical manifestation of sound into into all of those projects. That's interesting. I was wondering for that project if you if you consulted with anyone on on the musician bit. Absolutely. Um, so the um, the uh, trio that was there, the icicle trio, uh, was a violist, a violinist, and a pianist, and they were heavily involved in how the sound would be treated within the space. And Michael Yantis was our acoustic engineer. And he was, um, he was as much of, he played architect as much as he played acoustician and lighting designer and many other things. He was very much a, um, a collaborative spirit in the project where um, he would hear from the users that we can either make it perfect for piano, viola and violin, or we can make it okay for everything. And having those kind of decisions from an expert like that really helped us architecturally to say, how do we need to treat this space? And it had to be something that was adaptable. And that's why the walls are all different. That enabled it. You notice it was a flat floor too. The stage is just a stage that can move around. It allowed for theater in the round so that if there was a performance that was exceptionally bright, it could be turned toward the wall that would absorb that sound. Or if you had a, uh, a performance that was, ex was, um, was not exceptionally bright, it could be turned and uh, presented from a smooth wall. The back wall that um, I don't know if you saw in the photos was a two inch thick plaster wall that's canted. So all sound just disappeared into it. So it was very, very absorbent. So we had these sort of different characters of the wall in addition to the Pythagorean stories of odd and even. Very practical question. Does power of place cost more to design and build? Uh, it could, yes. Um, Cottonwood um, did not cost more, um, I would say. It was, the budget was $700,000 um, and we built that project for $700,000. Uh, it's a very, very humble um, building. So it was able to stay there. Um, I do think that you could put a cost premium on it, to be honest. Um, you could also constrain the size, um, scope, scale in order to, to match your budget or meet your budget. For your last project, the Cottonwood project, uh, Greg asks, was co the Cottonwood tree actually used in that, in that project? You know, that's, that's a really interesting question. Cottonwood Canyon um, is named after um, a stretch of the John Day River where there are dense cottonwood trees growing around the river um, because this is out in the open meadow and it was a cow camp for 75 years. Um, the cottonwoods are gone from this site. Uh, so there are no cottonwood trees here. It's, um, it's clad with juniper and the structure is, um, is Douglas fir. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, John asks, why was the array of solar panels limited to just part of the Oregon building roof? In addition, what is the purpose of the fencing, aesthetic or functional? The purpose of the fencing is, I'll start with that, um, is functional. Um, it's, it's part of um, the idea of the corral. It's also um, the space within which um, the lawn could be planted, which was something that we, we definitely had some, uh, some push and pull on that with Oregon State Parks. Um, Walker Macy and Signal both felt that it should be prairie that just flowed right through and you would have meadow right up to the building. However, thinking about fire danger on the site and given the prompt of, of brush fires that worked their way across this meadow, having an irrigated landscape adjacent to the building that could then be used for outdoor gathering, uh, family reunions, weddings, et cetera, um, could have that contained space. And that then created a space that could be rented periodically. Uh, and then the question about the solar array, um, that scale, we would have preferred to cover the whole thing consistently with, uh, with solar uh, panels. That was a grant from the state. And it was the, the right amount of array to produce all the power that the building needs. So it's a net zero electric or electricity building. Um, that I should caveat by saying that it's only heated by the wood stove. So it's a very, very high efficiency, low particulate wood stove that's used to heat it. So it has a pretty small electrical demand. It's about six kW 
um, that it produces um, and it produces all of its energy throughout the year. Thank you. So we have a, <clears throat> excuse me, an attendee from Washington and she says, since I live in Washington, rainwater is an issue on my property. And she wants to know where she can find a contractor who would install permeable paving. <laughs> I'm not sure if you if you know of someone or if you'd prefer to answer in an email. <laughs> um, yeah, if you want to email me, I could connect you with a couple of earthwork contractors. We're um, we're working in King County, so I don't know if you're in King County, um, but permeable paving is a big part of um, of working in Snoqualmie and North Bend. So if you want to contact me through Heather and Jake, uh, please do. We can make that happen. Okay. Uh, Glenn says, what kind of time is involved in these projects from start to end of design? It seems there's as much preliminary legwork plus community engagement to issuing deliverables for construction. Good question. Yes, that's a really, really good question. Um, so there are a range of project types here. I'll pick on the biggest and the smallest. Um, so Cottonwood uh, was part of a master plan. So it did have a very long life before it went into design of the building. Um, we like to call that uh, for the architectural component, a discovery and project definition phase where we're defining the footprint of the building, uh, how big it is, what the budget is, uh, timeline for it, um, et cetera. Uh, that said, it was envisioned as a 15,000 square foot environmental education center that was bigger than the barn. So when we became involved, that went from 15,000 to 1,500 plus 1,500 covered outdoor space. Um, so. The design timeline for that one was pretty conventional for a project of that size. It was about three months for um, design iteration, uh, then about three months for construction documents, and then went for permitting. Since it's rural, we had a permit in a week, um, whereas in Seattle, it takes about a year to get a permit right now. Um, so we're about six months from sort of first brief to um, construction ready. And then construction was about a year um, it, the folks who built it uh, had two people living on site because it's about 40 miles from the nearest anything. Um, so it, it, it took quite a bit of time to build. And then the other side is Georgetown Wet Weather Treatment Station. That was in design for quite some time. Um, that one we actually started pursuing uh, two years before the RFQ was released. So we really got to know the project uh, well before the project was released. And then design and community engagement probably added I would say it added a year to the duration of design. It was in design for about two years. Um, and that I think makes many of the people on the call as architects makes their head just explode. No, the fee wasn't double what it should be. <laughs> um, it's, it, was, it was a challenge. Um, community yeah. engagement, certainly there was, there was fee for that time. However, we really had to dual purpose everything we could so that when we were working with the, the agency, with the county, um, we had to dual purpose those materials so that the design iteration to satisfy their brief was also usable for um, community engagement. And community engagement by King County, they have a um, race and equity toolkit. Um, so equity and social justice are at the core of what King County has been doing for a decade. Um, so it's not just checking the box of community engagement. It's not just, okay, here it is put your stickies on the one you like and we'll pick the one we like. It was nine meetings with a design advisory committee um, to really listen and, and get it right and build trust uh, with the constituency because ratepayers are building these things. It's, it's the county, yes, they have project managers and engineers who are, are, are the client and we have engineers and architects and architect architects. However, the ratepayers are the ones we have to answer to and King County takes that very, very seriously. Right, we're a city agency here too at Monona Terrace and we have a similar race and equity process we go through for all of our projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of does segue nicely from something you said in your answer here, with the design process so exploratory, how do you structure your fee and manage your time? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. And we've um, it's something that we're continuing to refine. Um, we have um, changed the way uh, we work to not start at schematic design um, because it seems like when we start at schematic design, uh, we wind up redoing schematic design three times and then we have to call it construction documents and then we deal with the mayhem that happens in construction. Not that that happens. <laughs> um, we've instituted a, a discovery phase 
that allows us to do that definition and iteration and exploration with the, the owner or the client prior to going into schematic design. So when we are schematically designing something, we are designing the thing that everyone expects. So there is that discovery phase. And I would say that that's about um, a two to 3% fee increase or three, two to 3% fee offset um, for just for rough order of magnitude of what that might cost. Um, we would prefer for it to be in addition to the total fee for the project. Um, many times it's not. We have to still stay within that 10 to 12% and we have to figure out how that, um, that fee can be utilized. We do sometimes use the Washington State fee schedule that identifies services like that as supplemental services. So they are justifiable to municipal agencies if the, if the team is, is willing to take that route. And when typically there's a brief that has not had either a master plan or a pre-design phase, um, that is typically implemented. Many organizations are doing pre-design studies uh, and that's something that we've really been putting ourselves into to be the, be the consultant for those pre-design studies because that's where I really think we can thrive on figuring out programming, manifesting into a, a physical um, facility for the organization. Thanks. We have one more question in the queue and it's, it's from uh, Jake's and, and my friend, Josh Johnson, who has um, program preview speakers. And he's also really educated in design, or excuse me, he's really interested in design education. So I can see where he might be coming from with this question. He says, wonderful work that consistently demonstrates terrific sensibilities. Was there something in particular that Mark could identify in his upbringing that informed the respect for nature? That's a great question. <laughs> I, I, I think there are a handful of things. Um, when I was, uh, well, my, my parents were always getting us outside. Um, however, when I was 13, uh, my parents sold the house and the cars and um, took my brother and me on a boat for a year. And there was something that came from being out in the water. We went down the East Coast and out to the Bahamas and the dry Tortugas. And there was a lot of, a lot of puttering on my part in marshes and in a little boat and chasing fish. and um, just stillness in nature that I think that that imprinted something on me um, that that is really um, it, it found its place when I was at Jones and Jones. Um, I think Jones and Jones is very much a nature based uh, practice that um, joins architecture and landscape architecture as a, as a unified expression. And then my path through Miller Hall um, with real deep, deep sustainability and, and engagement was, was a big part of, of my upbringing. Mm. Thanks for that question. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I believe you mentioned you visited Falling Water. Yeah. I've got a couple more that are slipping in here and, and um, I'll, I'll take this last one too because I'm curious about the answer myself. And that is, is your water treatment design a model for other locations? It, it could be, yes. Um, Jacob's Engineering, um, so I'll go I'll start technical and then I'll move to, um, to uh, ephemeral. So Jacobs Engineering is, uh, they're a big name in, in water treatment around the world. Um, this facility is adaptable. Um, one of the decisions that was made was to use a fairly, um, fairly simple treatment system that would allow the facility to grow in place. So imagine, um, I'll try to put this in simple terms. Um, it's a large space needed to treat water with essentially a stirrer in the middle of it. Um, it's very rudimentary. It, um, you know, imagine that you've got, um, you've got muddy water and you slowly stir it and the mud slowly settles out of it. It's very, very simple. And then the mud then goes off into a tank and then is sent to the uh, treatment facility. That can be expanded by pulling that stirrer out and putting vertical membranes, which are very, very technical they're not highly used yet, but they were able to um, quadruple the size of the facility without adding more volume to the buildings. So it's a very innovative process. We felt by um, uh, future-proofing um, how the facility uh, would age over time. And that's something that is, is key to these facilities because they used to be 
on the you know the city lines. They used to be out away from the community, and now there is none of that space. The wastewater treatment facilities are in the communities. So, in order to expand, expansion in place was critical. And then from the demonstration question, from a landscape architecture uh, standpoint, the facility treats all of its water that falls on its surface in place. So none of the water that falls on it actually goes into the combined sewer overflow, which I think is just a really funny poetic solution. And it's an example for um, industrial or municipal sites that are in a high water table area. Because we're by the river, we have a very high water table. So using bioretention and rain gardens, the water is able to be treated on site in place. Um, the dry vials are all pervious paving. So we don't have that concentrated water that's running off into the, the water system. And then as an example, um, Miller Hall's work has been instrumental in uh, how infrastructure can become part of the, uh, the urban environment. Um, and our work, um, we continued the work at, at Georgetown Weather with Chelan uh, uh, Water Storage, which was, was really just a tank underground, but nothing could be built on top of it. So working with a landscape architect, we played with the idea of of occupiable space and suggested a park uh, that would be on the, the roof of this tank. Mm -hmm. So yes, they are, they are demonstration opportunities for how to think about infrastructure a little bit differently. That's great. Well, I think, uh, I think we've wound down. And uh, again, Mark, thank you for, for a wonderful presentation. It was well, thank you all. Very much. I'm, Certainly going to keep your website bookmarked so I can keep track of watch, watch some projects as they are <laughs> posted as you go along. Well, we are in the process of um, of building out a new front door, so you'll notice mm -hmm. that it's a little bit. Um, you have to sneak your way in. Um, we're actually going to build it, it. It's built, and I just have to go do the content. So back to Jake's uh, question. <laughs> with, um, with all that extra time you have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So, and I do want to thank uh, once again our, our our partner in crime here, the AIA Wisconsin Group, who has done a, a, a terrific job of booking the three past speakers that we've enjoyed. Um, Jake, any final words? I just want to say thank you very much for showing us these projects. Um, it's great to see the kind of work other people are doing in other parts of the country and how it can inform the things we do here. Because while we're you know, different in a lot of ways environmentally. We're also very much the same in a lot of ways. And so kind of getting across sampling of a lot of different things is so inspiring. So thank you. And, and thanks Heather for hosting these talks. You bet. And for our audience, thank you. I wanna let you know, we are planning a June lecture that will return to a Frank Lloyd Wright topic. So hold on to your hats. Oh. <laughs> I'll have to join so. that one. Yes, his birthday is June 8th. So in June, we must we must program Frank Wade Wright. Right. Awesome. Uh, so thank you so much, everybody. Have a great weekend. And uh, thanks again, Mark. Great. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks day. a lot. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>